Welcome again to worship. Would you take your Bibles, please, and open to Isaiah 9. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7. If you're new, I'm Pastor Josh, and I am working through a little bit of a cold. So we're going to see how this goes today, but you're safe because this is on video. <laughs> you are not right next to me. But welcome to those that are tuning in. It's good to have you with us. Welcome to our Rhinelander crew. We're glad that you are uh, gathered together and worshiping the Lord. This Advent season leading up to Christmas, we have been camping in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. And today we're looking at one of the three Emmanuel prophecies that are unique to Isaiah, which gets read in Advent every year because it anticipates the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, and the arrival of this ideal king, the one who would decisively change the course of history, rule with justice, and bring peace. This is Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thanks to the Lord for this, his word. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, your vision of peace and wholeness comes to us in sweeping revelations, and in tiny signs of hope. Kindle our hearts today that we might know your peace. Keep us from growing weary of waiting so that we don't miss the glory of your appearing. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, every year around this time, new books are published and released for people to buy them at Christmas. Uh, one that was released November 15th this year is entitled The Queen, Her Life by Andrew Morton. And it is obviously timely given the Queen's uh, recent passing this year. The description of the book on Amazon reads as follows. Painfully shy, Elizabeth Windsor's personality was well suited to her youthful ambition of living quietly in the country, raising a family, and caring for her dogs and horses. But when her uncle, King Edward VIII, abdicated, she became heir to the throne, embarking on a journey that would test her as a woman and as a queen. Ascending to the throne at only 25, this self-effacing monarch navigated endless setbacks, family conflict, and occasional triumphs through her 70 years as the Queen of England. The description on Amazon goes on to describe her, uh, well, the book. It goes on to describe the book, and we, in a nutshell, know that this is a biography, and it's about the Queen. And we know from the snapshot that she was shy and quiet, she liked horses and dogs, she ascended the throne at 25. She ruled as queen for 70 years. The description of the book tells us who the queen was in a snapshot, a book released the very year she died. The passage before us in Isaiah 9 does the same thing for us 
about Jesus. It tells us who he is. The interesting thing is, it was written not the year he died, not a few years after he died. It was written 700 years before he was born. And in this snapshot, we learn he will be a great light and a joy to his people, that he will usher in a sense of victory and freedom from oppression, that he will take on this mantle at his birth, and that he will rule as King David, uh, he will rule on King David's throne forever. Now, different sermons do different things. Uh, some answer the question, how do I live? Some, what do I need to know? But others are more personal and answer the question, who is this person? That's this sermon. This passage leads us to ask that question about Jesus. Who is he? And just like the summary of that book, The Queen, her life, answers that question in a number of ways about Queen Elizabeth, this passage answers that question about King Jesus. And so I just want to look at seven promises about our Savior that we read about in this passage, seven facets of Christ, descriptions of who he was and who he would continue to be forever. Okay, that's our plan. Who is Jesus? That's the question, and this scripture answers that. And the first uh, promise that we see is that he shines light. That's verses one to two. Which, by the way, Matthew quotes in Matthew 4, verses 12 to 17. He quotes this part of Isaiah to show how Jesus fulfills this promise. Listen to it in Matthew 4. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun. In land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What this means is that Jesus is the lifter of the lowly. He is the forgiver of of sinners. He is the redeemer of the worst of the worst. You see, Zebulun and Naphtali were the first regions to be defeated because of their idolatry. In Isaiah's time, they were the first to be defeated. Now they would be the first to see the light of Christ shining in all its welcome and its warmth. There's a call to repent, but there's a call to come and know Christ. The kingdom of heaven is near. That's who Jesus is. He shines light. He brightens up gloomy souls in distress. He honors the humbled. Not just because they have been unjustly oppressed, but even when they have caused their own oppression, Jesus offers a way forward. His light dawned in history, and it dawns in the darkest of times in our lives. He shines light. So that's just the first promise as we kind of plow through this this prophecy that we read every Advent and learn about who Jesus is. That's the first promise. He shines light. The second is this. He increases joy. That's verse 3. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing plunder. There are a few promises of joy here. First, that Jesus will enlarge a nation, which he did spiritually. Uh, Romans 9, 6 to 8 explains this pretty clearly. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. It is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Jesus fulfilled this promise of Isaiah by welcoming anyone who believes. 
Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, all are one in Christ. Anyone can come to Christ. Anyone who believes that Jesus lived and died and rose again and proclaims that truth can be saved. And this nation of God's people has been enlarged because of Jesus' work. And then when that happens, there will be rejoicing like at harvest times or in times of victory. Not that this is the same thing as winning a war, but I have watched some pretty thrilling victories lately on the soccer field. Uh, we're still in the World Cup right now, and just uh, this week, earlier this week, uh, the Croatians played the Japanese in uh, this knockout game. And uh, there's a picture that I have of the Croatian goalie, uh, Livakovic, who stopped three of Japan's penalty kicks. How does that happen? How does he stop their penalty kicks? I still don't understand that. But he stopped three of their penalty kicks. And the picture that you see is him with his arms raised wide as his teammates are running at him, thrilled uh, with their victory. And the team members of Japan in the background, just with their heads down, they were weeping in agony as the Croatians were rejoicing in victory. Croatia could not contain their joy in victory. Isaiah was explaining that because of Jesus, there will be uncontained rejoicing. He increases joy, and there will be victory. That's the promise of our Savior. That's the next promise that I want to think through with you about our Savior is that he wins battles. That's what the, the whole discussion of Midian's defeat is about in verses four to five. It's this reference to Judges seven and the account of this strong leader, Gideon, leading his people to decisive victory. And it was a miracle because they only had a handful of people. They had this small force against this mass uh, of, of soldiers and this massive enemy army. In a similar way, Jesus was just one man. But his death and resurrection freed us from the yoke of sin and slavery and shame and oppression that comes when we hide from him and live our own way. He wins battles. There are conflicts and battles going on around the world all the time um, that, frankly, I think most of us are unaware of. But the most visible these days is obviously the war in Ukraine. Imagine the scene right now, if Russia pulled out tomorrow, all their forces, all their tanks, all their weapons, the bombing stopped, the fighting stopped, the invasion stopped, the occupation stopped, they just pulled out. Imagine the scene in the streets of Ukraine, all the burdens of war lifted. All the oppressors gone. All the battle gear now unnecessary. That scenario, I think, is beyond our imagination in many ways. But spiritually, that is exactly what Jesus accomplished and offers us in the midst of our own personal struggles with sin. He wins battles. The next promise, he receives worship. This is the one maybe that I'm the most excited to kind of delve into a little bit with you. Verse six, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So there are four titles at the end of verse six. And the first three imply divinity, strongly, clearly. Uh, the adjective wonderful in the title Wonderful Counselor means supernatural. In Isaiah 28, verse 29, it's Yahweh who is wonderful in counselor. So this is a parallel to uh, our everlasting God, Yahweh, that Jesus would be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God is just straightforward, that title, that Jesus is called 
mighty God. If you ever encounter somebody who doesn't believe that Jesus is God, they're part of one of the different heresies that have been argued over the centuries about the nature of Jesus, that he isn't God. This is one of the most powerful scriptures to quote to them, that Jesus will be called mighty God. Jesus is God. And that's just plain fact on the face of, of this scripture. And then he's everlasting father, which is an equating of Jesus the son with Jesus the father. It's a verse in a title that ties them together as parts of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's a paradox to give a child yet to be born the name Everlasting Father, but he will be this perfect ruler over his people that he will love as his children forevermore. And the clearest example of Jesus fulfilling this prophecy is when uh, Thomas, his disciple, after Jesus has been raised from the dead and Thomas has not been with him the first time the disciples saw him raised and said he wouldn't believe unless he touched Jesus, gets to touch Jesus' um, wounds from his crucifixion. And he kneels powerfully. He kneels before Christ. And he proclaims to, to Jesus, my Savior and my God. And Jesus receives his worship. Jesus receives worship. He receives worship. That's a promise about our Savior. Next, he leads justly. That's what the beginning of verse 6 was all about when it said that the government will be on his shoulders. So in verse 4, the rod of the oppressor was on our shoulders. Now, a fair and just government will be on his shoulders. In verse 6, you know how we might talk about shouldering a burden. Or we may talk about the mantle of power that rests on this person's shoulders. That's what the government on his shoulders means. The promise is that he leads justly. Uh, my seminary professor, D.A. Carson, does a good job, I think, at processing through justice. Uh, he said this, Doubtless on the longest haul, before God's tribunal, Justice will be done and will be seen to be done. Doubtless, too, there are enough temporal rewards and blessings to remind us that God is in control. But in the mystery of providence, there are also enough anomalies to remind us that ultimate justice is not found in this world. And this, of course, is true to life, the ultimate realism. So to say that Jesus leads justly doesn't mean that there will be no more injustice ever in this world. We are between the already and the not yet. Jesus has already conquered death and Satan and sin, but he has not yet returned to make all things new. And we, we wait in the in-between where there's tension in this world and there's some mystery at times. And we process through the loss of our loved ones, and we process through the difficulty of injustice in this world, but we know that Jesus leads justly. And again, I mentioned it last week, but the path to the kind of justice that Jesus has designed us for and designed us and called us to pursue, we find when we follow Christ, when we trust our, our lives to him and then live as he would live our lives. We're waiting for that time to come. We're working for justice in the meantime now. Our faith is realistic. It's not Pollyannish. It's not just idealistic. And yet we have a Savior that leads justly right now. Our call is to follow him with all we've got. He leads justly. All right, we're getting further along in our list of these different descriptors of, of Jesus, these different facets of Christ. Only two more to go. The next promise about our Savior is this. He administers peace. That's what this week is all about. Peace. He's called the Prince of Peace. And the beginning of verse 7 says, Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
We talked about peace in the fruit of the Spirit series. In Hebrew, the word is shalom, which meant wholeness, completeness, soundness, health, safety, prosperity. It kind of had all those things wrapped up together within it. And it had this implication, shalom does, has this implication of permanence. This ongoing, there's an ongoing eternal enduring nature to this shalom, this peace. Peace was God's promise made to God's people from the very beginning. And now the nation is being enlarged spiritually. Now when it comes to peace, it, it's almost necessary for us to be able to see it because of surrounding unrest. Almost by the very definition of peace, it's calm in the midst of storms. It's light that shines in the darkness. That's the kind of peace that we experience now. And that's definitely the sense that we get here in this passage. There's peace after the, the defeat of the enemy. There's peace when the light shines in the darkness. There's peace when the, the rod of the oppressor is lifted off of the shoulders of those that are enslaved. But here in Isaiah 9, 7, we learn that this is a perfect, permanent, eternal peace. There will be no end to this peace. And that brings us to the final promise that he reigns forever. That's why this peace is eternal, because he reigns forever. Verse 7 again. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. I am so ready for this kind of leadership. I am so tired of the kind of flawed leadership that our world puts up for us. I am so ready for the character of our Lord to be alive as he reigns forever. History has seen a number of great dignitaries. If you look up lists of great kings, you may find King Charlemagne or King Cyrus or King Henry VIII of England or King Louis XIV of France. You might hear mention of dignitaries like we've talked about, Queen Elizabeth II and her 70-year reign. All worth our time studying, all worth our time knowing about. But friends, the greatness of this king, promised in Isaiah, will never end. He will be a descendant of King David and he will reign forever. The only way that that can happen is if he is both God and man. And Jesus fulfills that, that promise. That's who he is. And so this Advent, I believe we're called on this week to open up Isaiah 9, 1 through 7 and just consider who Jesus is and seven promises about our Savior and this Emmanuel prophecy show us that he shines light, he increases joy, he wins battles, he receives worship, he leads justly, he administers peace, and he reigns forever. And while I said at the outset that some sermons are about action and some sermons are more about information, and that this sermon is just more about like listening and knowing who Jesus is, I can't help but, but think and process a little bit with you about how we are to respond to this. Just knowing who Jesus is, what does that mean for us in our lives? What's our call, having dwelt on this passage in Isaiah? Well, I believe it's this. I believe we all need to just stop, to pause, to rest, to stop, 
We need to stop what we're doing long enough to be in awe of Jesus. Not a rolling stop, not a yield, but a full stop with all our thoughts, all our hearts, all our attention on him. That's what Advent is about. And it's the call that is now going out around the world in this season. This text is being read all over. That's what Advent is about. Pausing long enough to recognize who Jesus is and then continuing on following in his way. A little like how this year in mid-September when Queen Elizabeth died, so many things stopped. People were touched all over the world. Millions of people watched her funeral. People who never met her, and even those who didn't live in Britain, stopped for a moment. We all kind of hit the pause button for just a second. Why? Why does it, uh, 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 a passing like that, of a dignitary like that, why does that affect us? I think because she did her job for a really long time, 70 years. She took on the role as monarch from her father who died, and she led in her own way remarkably well. But at her best, she was still flawed. Advent is a time to remember that Jesus is our eternal king, And his perfect rule will never end. And he brings peace, a completeness, a fulfillment, a wholeness. Friends, I minister alongside and walk alongside and am friends with and talk with and cry with and pray with so many of you. And my prayer right now is for your peace, that you would Stop, that you would recognize God's goodness. Simply that. He brings peace. That's our focus this week. It's so easy to forget. And that's why we need the reminder. That's why we lit the candle today that represented peace. The good news of the gospel is peace. Peace from worry, peace from dysfunction, peace from resentment, peace because we can know wholeness and rest in our souls now and forevermore. That's who our Savior is. So stop this week long enough to take that in and believe it this Christmas. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the message of your prophet Isaiah. Thank you for the fulfillment of that promise in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gift of faith that you have given us to respond. Lord, if there's anyone that isn't responding, if there's anyone that hasn't responded yet, if there's anyone that's unsure about whether they've responded, I pray right now that they would stop that they would say, Lord, my life is yours. And that this Christmas there would be no doubt and they would experience your peace. I pray that, Lord, for a number of people that I can think of very specifically right now. But I also pray that for our congregation. I pray that for our surrounding Northwoods community. I pray that you would use us to allow Christ and his influence and his message and the gospel to shine. This Christmas, may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you this week.